The biggest misconception about environment supportive interventions is that we do these interventions as an additional effort only to help the environment. First of all, the environment, nature, the ecosystem, Mother Earth, she doesn't care. It has been here for four and a half billion years. That is 22 and a half thousand times longer than us. And it doesn't need people. It is us people that need nature. When nature thrives, we thrive. And when nature falters, we falter. Nature does not care whether we choose to regard or disregard it, because our actions will determine our faith, not the faith of nature. And in an adaptive way, nature will be able to go on. The problem is that this point of view, this mindset, does not influence the way we act and the way we make decisions. The great potential of nature-based solutions can be found in the making uh, of a connection between its contribution to the environment, while at the same time contributing to society and economy. Because where our collective future is not able to affect our decisions, money does have a strong leverage point in future scoping, decision making and the design for the built environment. Therefore, this video explains the business side of nature-based solutions. When discussing money, business and economics, we always come to the law of supply and demand, which is seeking for the equilibrium between price and quantity in production, consumption and distribution processes. And we also look at the gross domestic product, the GDP, by which we evaluate a country's wealth. These established notions, however, lack in taking into consideration the effects of the production, distribution and consumption on the environment. For this reason, often price tags are not fair as externality, externalities like, for instance, the pollution of the process of production, the transportation or the waste of packaging is being disregarded. So, if economics seem to be at the center of our decision making, solutions can perhaps be found in environmental economics. Environmental economics comes forward from the idea that any development on the planet should be made with the consideration of sustaining the quality of life for future generations to come. It regards the global economy, but includes the value of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the things the planet is basically contributing for free, such as the filtering of our water, the capturing of carbon and the provision of energy. In general, four families of ecosystem services can be distinguished. The first family are the regulating services, like those provided by wetlands, such as air purification, water purification, water regulation, but also insects pollinating crops can be considered as a regulating service. The second family are provisioning services, like those provided by plants, like medicine and fibers. Thirdly, there are the supportive services, facilitating all other services, like for instance the nutrient cycle, photosynthesis and soil formation. At last, we have cultural services, which are the valuable benefits of spending time in nature, like recreation, health and heritage. For all these services, a rich biodiversity is proven to, uh, proven to be fundamental for healthy ecosystems. But how can the valuation of ecosystem services approach protect biodiversity? Well, Imagine a national policy encouraging the planting of trees. When we consider the market value of timber, the cost will appear to outweigh the benefit. However, these planted trees also deliver currently unvalued benefits, such as water storage, air purification, soil stabilization, recreation, food production, defense from wind, carbon storage, wildlife habitat, fuel production, cooling and flood prevention, among others. These are all direct values which can be assessed based on the quantity of spaces which can have a direct performative indicator and depend on a measurable quantity of, for instance, canopy or permeable surface. The moment we, re uh, we recognize these direct values and monetize them we focus on and, and we focus on optimizing these additional values, the balance of cost and benefits will shift completely, proving the benefits to be higher than the cost. But Monetizing of ecosystem services is only one tool. A problem is that an optimal set of benefits from ecosystem services does not always mean all environmental factors prevail or biodiversity will be protected. For instance, large fields of monoculture can have high services and benefits, but the biodiversity and the adaptive capacity is low, with a high vulnerability to diseases. 
Besides direct values, we have to take indirect values into consideration. Indirect values are composite, context-sensitive and society-dependent values and they vary, uh, on, uh, they, they vary with the attitude of a specific society towards ethics, knowledge, risk and culture and the level of expectation in relation to the quality of the services provided. Examples of difficultly uh, monetizable indirect values are many intrinsic values of nature, such as the seeing and hearing of wild birds, but also livability. The valuation of livability depends on the amount and quality of services provided to a community compared to the amount and the quality of services which were expected by that particular community. This can, for instance, be seen in the different levels of acceptance in flood management between countries like the Netherlands and Bangladesh. Two approaches that account for less monetizable factors include firstly, revealed preference, which takes into consideration the typical purchases related to a natural value and other associated things on which money is spent. For the example of watching births, this means the cost of camera equipment and outdoor but for livability, this implies the value of properties. This way, insight can be provided in the way a particular service is valued. Secondly, we have stated preference, which is the willingness to pay for a particular ecosystem or the compensation you are willing to accept for its loss. So, environmental economics focuses on assigning money value to both resources being harvested from the environment, but also resources that have to be maintained in order to preserve the climate and the hydrological and carbon cycle. And at last, it focuses on the value of this maintenance. In order to evaluate this improved way of economics, the focus lies with the Genoon Progress Indicator, the GPI, instead of the GDP. The GPI includes the externalities like pollution and resource depletion, but also employment and education, into the evaluation of the wealth of a nation. And the fact is, we're not actually doing so great. In order to make sure that both the GPI and the GDP continue growing, environmental economics pushes for regulations capable of decreasing pollution, for example by making use of rewards, caps and taxes, or the compensation of emissions or other ways of paying for externalities. The concept of including the environment into any kind of assessment has the potential to change practice. For instance, when building an asphalt road, the loss of permeability or biodiversity are considered merely as a limitation or are maybe not even taken into consideration, depending on the scale of this new road. Basically, externalizing the environment. The aim of nature-based solution is to re-internalize the environment and to also show value for the society and economy. Highlighting these societal and economic values gives reason and pressure to mainstream and implement more and more nature-based projects. Sometimes this value comes in the simplest shape of money, but more often the values are rather complex to assign monetary currency to. The risk of this money-focused view, however, is the financialization of nature and pollution. When everything has a price tag, this would imply everything can be bought and sold and compensated. For nature to enter this market mechanism is unwanted, because it again brings back the focus on short-term gains over long-term gains. 